We've discussed several of the late, great director Satoshi Kon's projects here on Cinema Nippon. Today, let's take another step toward covering this anime auteur's entire filmography, with perhaps one of his greatest and one of his most underrated films. Re-released on DVD and Blu-ray earlier this month by Shout Factory and G-Kids, we're going to be taking a look at Millennium Actress. Millennium Actress was Satoshi Kon's first directorial film after Perfect Blue. Kon spent a solid four years without directing a complete film. On paper, this makes it seem like Kon was slow going to kick off his flurry of activity in the early 2000s, beginning with Millennium Actress. However, Kon stated in a 2002 interview that production on his second directorial effort began in 1998. This means that it wasn't actually that long after Perfect Blue that production on Millennium Actress began, just that the second film was extremely long cooking. In a way, Millennium Actress may be perhaps Cohn's most challenging film. Unlike all of his other directorial projects, it doesn't give away its conceit even after the credits roll. It pretends it doesn't even have a conceit, instead offering a solid story while actually telling another. In this respect, it goes without saying that you ought to check out Millennium Actress before we go and spoil the whole thing for you. Given that, we won't be spoiling anything until the very end of the video, but but if this is that one Satoshi Kon film that you've somehow avoided for this long, you owe it to yourself to see it spoiler free. Millennium Actress concerns itself with a pair of filmmakers, a director and his cameraman who have secured an interview with the reclusive yet monumentally famous actress Chiyoko Fujiwara. After a several decades long career between the 1930s and the 1960s, Chiyoko disappeared from the public eye abruptly. She entirely quit the film industry and refused to provide any interviews until the events of the film, which presumably occur around the turn of the millennium. Through her twisted memories, Chiyoko describes for the director and his young cohort the various events of her life and the numerous films in which she starred as a young woman. This leads to a very fragmented form of storytelling, balancing Chiyoko's recollections with plot synopses for some of her bigger film projects. In that same interview from 2002, Kohn commented on the inspirations for Millennium Actress and how it sprang directly from its predecessor. He stated, quote, to be honest, I care very little about the idea of the stalker in Perfect Blue. The storytelling aspects interest me much more. Looking at things objectively or subjectively gives two very different images. For an outsider, the dreams and the film within a film are easy to separate from the real world. But for the person who is experiencing them, everything is real. I wanted to describe that kind of situation, so I applied it in Perfect Blue. The producer was very interested in that type of concept, and he proposed making another film which would emphasize that aspect. He said he wanted to make a film that was like a Trump Lowell, and from there we made the story of Millennium Actress. So, for Perfect Blue, in the beginning there was a story, and to tell that story we applied this method. Whereas with the Millennium Actress, the method itself is the aim of the film. But it's a coincidence that these two films use this method. I would also like to try other styles of storytelling." End quote. This quote can go away to explain the type of abstraction that we end up with in Millennium Actress, as well as how such a fragment in story can seem so coherent. This ties into the first major theme of Millennium Actress, and perhaps the most important for the sake of discussing it, memory and the fickleness it acquires with age. The entire film is predicated on an interview between Chiyoko and one of her biggest admirers. In a world where young people, like the cameraman, don't even recognize the name Chiyoko Fujiwara, we have a childhood fan of Chiyoko asking her to put her record on film for the sake of posterity. Though the director's interests seem to principally lie in Chiyoko's job as an actress and the trials and tribulations that came from this period of her life, it quickly emerges that she has other ideas for the interview. Chiyoko is more than happy to discuss her past in film, but she's more interested in explaining the person who led her to work in film in the first place. As we learn, Chiyoko was a young woman in wartime Japan when a wounded painter came to stay in her parents' storehouse for a single night. She helped him hide while the police hunted him down. He gave her a memento of their meeting, a key on a necklace, which she treasured for years to come. When the opportunity arose to participate in films being shot in Japanese-occupied Manchuria, she immediately rose to the occasion, hoping to be reunited with the man there. 
From here, the film takes on a dual purpose, to explore Chiyoko's filmography through the rose-tinted glasses of the director, and to explain her eternal quest to track down the wounded artist who fled that fateful night. At points, we're not even sure that this young man is real, or if Chiyoko simply kept starring in films with the man or films which featured the same idea of unrequited lovers chasing one another. In this way, Millennium Actress is able to play with its virtual space through her life story and her oeuvre. For the duration of the film, the director and the cameraman even jump into her memories and explore the space she has created through her stories, taking us along with them. There's an argument to be made that Chiyoko and her love interest may be archetypes throughout all of fiction. They may simply represent the type of unrequited love so romanticized in stories all over the world and within the very films in which Chiyoko stars. This could account for why her personal life is wrapped up in and confused with her film work, seeing as how this type of love is idealized, and how said idealization could have bled into Chiyoko's own life. Either the character she plays and the character he is playing represent these types of archetypal lovers, or else Chiyoko and the man, as real people rather than characters, represent how art imitates life. Either way, the recursive nature of their encounters, and how Chiyoko and the man provide a center for all the narratives in which they appear, offer the idea of them being archetypes interacting in stories that revolve around them. This could be further represented in how they both wear red scarves, perhaps as a reference to the Red Thread story, an Asian legend with multiple variations that explains how faded lovers are tied together by invisible red threads. Though this visual comparison is never made super blatantly, the presence of the color red whenever the two interact may indicate this archetypal nature further, given how well entrenched the Red Thread story is. The recursiveness in Chiyoko's life extends beyond her lover and herself in her life in films. Essentially, the same memories replay in different movies and eras of Japanese history. First, a couple of police search for the artist in 1930s fascist Japan. Later, the exact same men appear in period garb in the late Edo period, committing minor variations on the same actions as they once more search for the same artist. This time, the duo appear in the context of a film, confusing the truth with fiction further. In a way, this ties in with Chiyoko's statement late in the film when explaining why she chose to tell her story at long last. In her words, by tomorrow, I won't remember. While these two men might appear to be real people, perhaps cropping up again in a fictional setting, there is one further component which complicates the recursive nature of Chiyoko's memory further. This time, we see a witch character, who first appears seemingly in a fictional capacity during the aforementioned Edo period, but who continues to chase Chiyoko through the ensuing years. The witch states after having Chiyoko's character in the film drink a 1,000-year tea, as she calls it, I love you, and I hate you more than I can bear. This makes us ask, then, is she supposed supposed to represent the director, Chiyoko's legacy, Chiyoko's self-image. No matter the explanation, her mere presence reoccurring throughout the remainder of the film further muddles what's real and what's fake in Chiyoko's life. Beyond these questions and explorations of memory, Satoshi Kon seemed to have another interest with Millennium Actress, that being to pen a love letter to cinema at large. As many filmmakers are wont to do at one point or another in their life, Kohn sought rather early on to explore just what makes movies so magical, and why they affect us so much. This is perhaps most obvious with how Millennium Actress presents itself as an experiment in many different styles. This would be seen again in Paranoia Agent, with each individual episode of the later series encapsulating a different interest, character, tone, sometimes even art style. Within an 80-minute film, however, this experimentation was more truncated by necessity, seeing Cohn and company rush through numerous time periods, art styles, tones, and so on. By extension, we see these explorations as a love letter to film in how it allows all of these different experiments to take place before our eyes. Millennium Actress exists not just as a study in how film allows us to experience wondrous and fantastical worlds, or historic time periods after which we were born. It's also a love note to how films influence us, and how we can hold such fond memories related to the medium, both as creators and observers, as exemplified by the dichotomy between Shioko and the director. As we would later see with Paranoia Agent, observers of the film's events become part of the equation, drawing us into the fold just as the director is. In turn, the director becomes something of a parallel for Chiyoko. As we learn quickly, he pursues her as she did her love, 
meaning that, whether platonic or romantic, their intentions throughout the film are more or less identical. The cameraman, meanwhile, acts as a barometer for the audience. He serves as our comic relief, our situational grounding, and the voice inside our heads discussing how absurd some of the film's events can become. It's through this mutual relationship that we will, at times, find ourselves falling into the groove of the narrative, typically just as he is beginning to show genuine affect from what he's witnessing. Furthermore, Millennium Actress explores how films can encapsulate our times, in this case discussing the 1930s through roughly the 1960s. This period of time is selected because it contains the entirety of Chiyoko's film career. On a more metatextual level, however, we may glean that these years were selected to provide a cross-section of the young medium of film's early years, particularly in Japan, a country with a unique history with cinema. We see the institution of sound film in the 1930s during the height of Japan's imperial period, when Chiyoko travels to occupied Manchuria to work in the entrenched studio system. As she ages, the industry evolves and we witness the changes in form, from monochrome to color, and in ideology, from fascist state-controlled film to American-controlled occupation-era output. Chiyoko's career ends in the period of uncertainty, the 1960s, with Japan's cinema starting to flag in popularity thanks to the inception of television and the mundanity of major Japanese cinema at the time. Truly, Millennium Actress takes its position on the cusp of the 21st century to its logical extreme, looking back at the movies that made Satoshi Kon the filmmaker he was, as well as the movements that created Japanese film as it exists today. Millennium Actress also serves as an exercise in how film manipulates us in order to make us believe its messages, or its lies. This is achieved most directly through visuals, though more poignantly it occurs through narrative. In terms of visuals, Satoshi Kon and company show us how fluid of a medium animation truly is. In effect, we're not witnessing real people. These are lines and colors and images meant to represent people, places, and times. Rather than a photographic record, a recording of real people in real space and time, what we see are representations of the author's intent. Given that we're working with such an abstraction at a baseline, here our disbelief is already suspended, where in a live-action setting it may not be. Cohn uses this suspension of disbelief perhaps most interestingly in how one period is supplanted by another. Color palette, character age, background style, and so on will switch in the blink of an eye, explaining to us visually that we've moved on. For example, we see the transition between the Meiji and Taisho periods in the style of Yukio-e block prints, an artistic movement particularly popular during this overarching era. For those familiar with art of the time, this piece of visual shorthand further draws us into the idea that time has passed in a manner that live-action film may not be capable of, at least so smoothly. This is your last warning if you have yet to see the entirety of Millennium Actress, as we're about to discuss the big reveal that's never explicitly revealed in the film. With that being said, go check out the film if you haven't. For everyone else, 3, 2, 1, let's go! Millennium Actress also lies to us implicitly in its narrative, which is something we have sort of touched on throughout this video. Essentially, the film obscures its true intention and true narrative by the very nature of its framing, effectively telling one story while pretending to tell another. On the surface, this is a tale about Chiyoko Fujiwara, an aging actress who has come out of seclusion one last time to discuss her background as one of the country's biggest stars for a couple of decades. Through the director and the cameraman being drawn deep into her tales of unrequited love and behind-the-scenes takes on her biggest projects, the the truth becomes a bit muddied as to what actually occurred, what was part of a film's plot rather than Chiyoko's real life, and whether the anonymous painter holed up in her parents' storehouse was ever even real. This is implied to us through the inclusion of this painter character in several of Chiyoko's film plots, leading us to ask for any number of explanations. Did she make him up to spice up her story? Was her real-life unrequited love written into her films after the fact? Was she typecast into these sort of roles throughout her career? In the end, however, the truth comes to the surface when an elderly veteran of World War II appears before the director and the cameraman with direct evidence that this painter truly existed, that he was effectively a nobody, and that he died long ago, meaning that Chiyoko was chasing a ghost her entire life. In other words, the painter was the same as what she became. The quote from the film springs to mind that Chiyoko was, quote, pursuing the shadow of a person who wasn't there, end quote. 
This, in turn, explains why Chiyoko took on the interview in the first place. She has been, through the goofball duo, committing her memory to film as that painter committed his own will and memory to the canvas. In the end, she remarks, quote, After all, what I really love is the pursuit of him. End quote. This echoes his perceived interest in Manchuria, going to paint the landscapes up north, in other words, loving the pursuit of those new pastures. When we take a step back from this narrative, however, we realize something. That something being the true, underlying narrative of the film, which it never explicitly states. Chiyoko has, in her old age, began to lose her memory. Whether this is a true blue degenerative disorder, or it's simply her swapping details between stories she hasn't voiced in years, we get the sense upon a second viewing that there are portions of Chiyoko's filmography she believes actually occurred. This would explain the inclusion of real-life people as characters, like the painter and the police during the Edo period, or the reoccurrence of certain plot threads through her life and her films, or even the inclusion of her interviewers in the proceedings of her memories. Chiyoko is committing her memories to tape in a last-ditch effort to preserve them before they deteriorate further, and the men working with her either haven't detected this or they're simply too polite to comment. In a way, this recontextualizes both the light and dark moments of her memory into a harrowing tale of not only love lost, but memories fading. This is only further compounded when we realize that, of all the things Chiyoko has forgotten or mixed up, her anonymous painter is the one constant that has not faded over time. In fact, he has only grown brighter, infecting her other memories. Millennium Actress is arguably not Cohn's most respected project. That honor is typically deferred to Perfect Blue, Paranoia Agent, or Paprika. It's almost impossible to compare any of his projects, given how extremely diverse they are in terms of goals and execution. Sure, later films hone skills and borrow tricks from earlier projects, but in the end, Satoshi Kon left us with a terse, yet shockingly deep filmography, which has left a lasting impact on the medium of animation. We find it ultimately unfortunate that Millennium Actress and Tokyo Godfathers are typically relegated to the sleeper hits of Kon's work, thanks to its subtlety, realism, and fantasticism, which stand in stark contrast to the bombast and horror of most Kon's other works. Millennium Actress serves as a more than worthy addition to Kohn's filmography. Endlessly interesting and in need of more love, this film easily wins a place among the ranks of his others. Let us know what you think in the comments below, whether you agree or disagree, what your favorite Satoshi Kohn film is, and what you think of the two films we've yet to cover, Tokyo Godfathers and Paprika.